returning again to the vexed question of which is my favourite picture, Endymion there certainly comes very, very high on the list. That is the second version of the picture. Watts never lost track of an idea throughout his life, an idea for a picture. Um, both versions of this picture, the small one, which is highly finished, and this one were designed in the 1860s. The small one was carried forward, and it's in the neoclassical manner. It's probably only a quarter the size of the one we see here. And Diana is hovering over Endymion uh, as a solid figure, with all the draperies fluttering around her, with no visible means of support. Apart from it being such a glorious piece of painting, it might appear just a, a little silly. The large version here, which he blocked in at the same time, he put aside until 1902, and then finished very rapidly in his later symbolist manner. You see, Diana is, is approaching Endymion, but is she the rising full moon? Is she the goddess? There's a little of both there. And curiously, in the, in the small early version, Endymion's dog, for Endymion was a shepherd boy, Endymion's dog is fast asleep. In this version, the dog has woken up and is looking slightly alarmed at what's happening, as, as if he well might, as any of you who have read the story will know. And when Watts took up the picture and worked furiously upon it, as Mary tells us, she was out for the morning. And when she came back, she went into the studio to see what was in progress and stopped dead in front of the canvas and said, Oh, Senor, what a glorious dream you have given him. And Watts replied, and no, my dear, it's all moonshine. My wife often says I exaggerate. Um, I seldom argue with her because I generally think I'm right. And one of the things I say, which on the face of it may appear to be an exaggeration, is that Watts, in his painting life, shifted English painting through two centuries in one lifetime. When he started as a young man, he was always looking back over his shoulder to the 18th century, because it's what his patrons liked. He had to paint portraits to not only keep himself, but his ailing father and his two half-sisters as well, and was doing so from the age of 12, which is really quite frightening. And there's always this wonderful thing in England about if it was good enough for my father, it's good enough for me. Or better still, good enough for my grandfather, it's good enough for me. And so when Watts was starting out early in his career, the people who bought pictures, on the whole, favoured what their parents had liked, which was the 18th century manor. So in his early work, you often see him looking back over his shoulder to Rumney or Lawrence. But, unlike so many of his contemporaries, he was not content to fall into a groove. He experimented, he pushed things forward. The great difference between Watts and so many of his fellow artists of the period was that he wasn't frightened to take a risk, he wasn't frightened to fail. And it has to be said, if we're going to be fair, that he did fail quite a large number of times. And I think it's all to his credit that he dared to. And in consequence, what he managed to do in just one lifetime was drag English painting out of the 18th century. It went through a, a most dreadful doldrums at the beginning of the 19th. And he propelled it gently into the 20th with this astonishing little picture here. It's a vast subject in a small canvas. Its title is the Sower of the Systems. And it is Watts's idea, again, well ahead and aside of his time, 
of what the Big Bang Theory might have been, except that the Big, Big Bang Theory hadn't even been invented when this picture was painted. It, in fact, dates from 1902. And it is a vast figure. It's possible to see here the, the left leg and the heel flying out behind it, the shoulders, the arms, each side, the suggestion of a hand there, the tremendous swirl of the draperies, this vast figure hurtling through the universe, scattering the galaxies arm over arm as it does. I always feel if, if he'd actually put the head into it, he would have spoilt the effect. It's because the, the head of the figure is, is, is shrouded in clouds of glory and you just see the, the tremendous movement of it, that it, it makes it so fascinating. And it is also one of the most important pictures in the whole of English painting. Now, my wife may very well say I'm exaggerating again saying that, but it doesn't really have anything to do with the fact that Watts painted it. It's what it is. And what it is, is a moment of change. It's rare that you can actually put your finger down and say, that's where it changed. But this picture is a case in point. If you look at it as it is, the figure is there. It's still really, in its way, quite conventional. It isn't obvious at once to everybody, but a little observation will bring the figure to life for you. It's definitely there. It's, it's carefully drawn. It, in spite of all the swirling around it, there is actually a figure in the robes. But you just crank it up one more notch and it won't be. It's the actual changing point, the turning point, the, the pivot between purely representational painting and abstract. Well, at least that's my theory, and whether it's an exaggeration or not, I'm sticking to it. <laughs>